Wow, we like to say good evening to you. We like to say thank God for what He is doing in your life, and we like to welcome you here to Words to Live By with your truly, Anthony Clark. And it is certainly a blessing, and we count it a privilege just to be able to come before you and TV, satellite, whatever ways you are viewing social media. We just really appreciate God for you. And I pray that your day has been blessed. I want you to take this opportunity right now to share this live feed if you're watching on social media with your family, with your friends, because there is going to be some real good insight that's going to come out of the teaching. God is going to open our eyes, our intellect, and just he's just going to open us up to really experience more of him to know what he has to say about our lives. And so, uh, before I begin, I wanna to go to God in prayer. We wanna thank God for our opportunity. We wanna thank him for the start of a brand new day. We wanna thank him for everything that he's doing in our lives. So would you pray with me right now? Father God, we come now. Send Father, we thank you, we honor you. We give you praise, glory for everything that you are to us. Father, because you are love, and there's nothing we can do that would change the love that you have for us. There's nothing we can say, nothing can measure up to the love that you've already shown for us. For you said that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son. So right now, as we come to break bread, not only with those that are in this room, but we break bread with those who are watching and viewing right now. Father, go into each home, go into each office, go into each wherever they may viewing on their social devices or on television, go right there right now, Father. Bless them, grant them with the desires of their heart. Father, as they surrender to you, Father, I pray that you open up more to them. Pour out your spirit upon their lives that they can be impactful, be the city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid, that our light so shine before men that they will begin to see the good works and give our Father glory, which is in heaven. We honor you now in the master's name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. Again, welcome, and again, truly, I'm Anthony Clark, and I, I'm just elated that you are here. I'm elated that you are joining us. Um, we're dealing with a study, and we've been talking about spiritual identity. We've been talking about the truth, we're gonna expose the lie, and we're gonna deal with applications. Um, over life, we go through things and we have our various backgrounds and many of us are challenged with the notion of truly identifying that God really loves us. And there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can say to change that. His, his love, his, 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 his passionate love for us is not based on our performance or personal sense of worthlessness. We cannot influence God's love for us in any way. His love, he loves you right now to his fullest possible extent. Love reached from heaven when we didn't know him. Love came down as a part of God to simply come in the form of man to die for our sins. The Bible tells us no greater love than a man has for his friend than he lay down his life. And God laid down his life for you and I. And I know there are so many people that tell you, tell you that you need to do this in order for God to love you. But guess what? He loved you before you did anything. He, and he loves you. There's nothing you can do that would change the measure of love for, that he has for you because we know that in scriptures, God is love. So if you've been one that's been going through and you've been dealing with some things to where people have been putting all these things on you and you've been trying to really... Uh, discover how much God, love God has for you. I'm glad you tuned in. I want you to begin to share right now because there's somebody that's going through a storm. There's somebody going through an ordeal. Somebody has given up on God. They feel like God doesn't care, that God is blessing everybody else but them. And I'm quite sure all of us at some point in life have felt like that. Amen, audience? We have felt like God, God was blessing everybody else but us. And we felt like God loved us less. But you know what? That's a lie that the enemy wants you to believe. Yeah. Don't believe the lie. And so we're here to deal with some things. We're going to talk about some things. And we're going to discover uh, God's love and why he loves us. And how to deal with the lies 
And as we begin to really look at this, we're going to look at a variety of uh, Bible scenarios or Bible stories. We're going to embark on some things that you are familiar with. There are some passages that you are, have grown accustomed to. But we're really going to discover in this teaching, and if you're watching, you can simply inbox us. You can go to the website. You can email us, and I will certainly give you this teaching. I will give you notes and this so you can have to read, not just in this Bible study, but how many of us know we need to visit the Word of God every day? Yes. Timothy said, study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, but doing what rightly, dividing the word of truth. So let's look at Eve in the garden. We're going to go to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. And as you turn to it, we're going to read, I'm reading from the NIV. You may be reading from the Amplified, the King James, whatever you have that will help you uh, on your journey as you learn more about God and what God is doing in your life. I want you to leave this Bible study encouraged, knowing that God has a true love, and his love is not short. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? He asked, he asked another question. Verse 2 says, The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or ye will die. Here, believe it or not, the devil knew what God told Eve. And, and, and God told Eve, or uh, let me just back up. He told Adam that law, it was given to Adam, but because Eve was a part of Adam, she knew what God said. Because when the serpent asked her, he, she began to repeat what God said. And the devil will often come to you challenging you about things that God told you. When you hear a word from God, the enemy often comes trying to take away what was sown to you. I mean, I know many of you have heard the parable about the soil that went forth to sow seeds and how some of them fell. And likewise, the enemy don't want you blessed. The enemy don't want you to know that God loves you in spite of anything. That The enemy want you to get to a place where you begin to question God's very love for you. And we all know that he died for our sins. He died when we didn't deserve it. He loves us so much that he gives us grace and he gives us unmerited favor. He does not give us what we deserve, but because of Jesus, we are showered with grace. So here she explains to him. Verse 4 says, you will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Verse 6 says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good. Now, it never says it was an apple. It just says fruit. Amen? Amen. I know many of you have said apples. We just know it says fruit, okay? When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, what was the emotional lie that Satan was telling Eve in verse five? Look what the lie in verse five he was telling her. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Essentially, Satan was telling Eve that God was withholding the best from her. See how crafty and cunning the enemy is, how crafty and cunning Satan is. He tells her that God was withholding better from her. Now, how many of us in our everyday life are challenged with this very same notion that God is withholding what's right for us? 
God, why you didn't do this for me? God, why aren't you doing this for me? God, you, you can't possibly love me when you're withholding what I want. How many of us have lived long enough to know everything you want ain't good for you? Amen. Anybody ever, ever wanted something and, and when you got it, you found out it wasn't what you thought it was? Amen. Because it was pleasing to the eye. It looked good, but it wasn't good for you. And God had already instructed us. It's even with relationship. God says, don't, don't be unequally yoked. But because he's tall and he looks good, he's muscular, he, he plays on the football team, or he's an athlete, or any of these characteristics, you, you go after them because you're looking with the eye and not listening to the spirit. God loves you so much that he's already, have already given us what we need. How many of you found out that God knows what's best? In spite of what we thought, how many found out that God knows what's best? Amen. He convinced her that her life would be better if she distrusted God's love. What do you mean distrusted? She went against what he told her because she felt like he didn't love her enough to tell her the truth. See, look how deceptive the enemy can be. The enemy will come in to cause you to distrust God by giving you a lie. You ever been on social media and you find out that everything spread, but how many know a lie keeps going and going and people tend to, to take to a lie faster than they will the truth? It's because the enemy is telling them a lie. And they, people are so quick to distrust you in you, what you're doing, people are so quick to distrust what God is deemed for your life. But you have to have a made up mind that, God, I will trust you. The Bible said, lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him. The Bible said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. When it seems, un seems unpopular, he want you, me, tell somebody to trust him. God, love is so great that Eve concluded that God wasn't giving her what she deserved. She said she was going to take matters in her own hand. Listen, Eve concluded based on a lie. How many of our lives have been destroyed because of a lie? How many of our characters have been destroyed because of a lie? She had come to the place where she distrusted God. She believed what the enemy had told her, that she began to take matters in her own hand because she felt like he didn't love her enough to tell her what she wanted. And so she says, God, I'm not going to trust you. I'm just going to go ahead and do this my way. When God told you to wait, how many of us don't like the word wait? You that's watching, how many of you really don't like the word wait? Because we're living in a microwave society. Everybody wants everything instant. We want it right now. Say, I want it now. We can believe God can move now, but God said his timing and our timing don't go together. So we find ourselves distrusting God. And there are so many of us have distrusted God and we thought that God didn't love us because God would give us the car we wanted right then. When God had a better car waiting around the corner. Sometimes God would allow turn down to come in order to, for him to demonstrate how much he really loves you. God often would say no at this occurrence only to say yes at another occurrence. But how many of us truly Want to trust him. I'm finding that that trials work with patience. And when you have patience, you can truly walk in the overflow of what God wants for your life. Tell somebody to say overflow. overflow. What God wants for my life. So as a result, she ate. And she convinced her husband. Wow. Wow. 
Satan tempts us to be discontent, not to be in discontentment with our own life. Satan tempts us to make us say, you're not satisfied with what you have. Eve wasn't satisfied with just not working. She wasn't content with not having children, not having to have pain. Adam didn't have to go to work. Amen, somebody. <laughs> see, see, watch this. Look at the plan that God loved you so much he had for your life. But the enemy comes and calls you and tells you a lie that you become not content. What I kind of just say like this, we become ungrateful. Amen. When you're not content with what God has blessed you with, you become ungrateful. The Bible says in all things, do what? Give thanks. Be thankful. Paul says in whatever state I'm in, I learned, I learned, I have learned, I have learned. Come on, somebody. I have learned to be content. I've learned to be thankful. If my car has four tires, I'm thankful. <laughs> if my car have gas in it, the radio may not play all the time, but thank God I have a way to get around. I can be grateful because if I'm happy now, God has enough love for me that he's about to release to me greater blessings. Because I heard the truth of the word says that he is a rewarder. Say with me, he's a rewarder. Of them that diligently seek him. Let's look at Exodus 17, 1 through 7. Eve thought she was going to get more by disobeying God, and she ended up with less. How many of us feel that we can get more by doing it our way? Uh, all of us been there. You might as well just wave your hand and, and say, how many of us have disobeyed God for more and end up losing? Amen. Can somebody testify? But God brought me out. Amen. Now, if he didn't love you, he would have left you there. Yes. If he didn't care for you, he wouldn't have picked you up when you're falling down. That's a great God. And so in building our spiritual identity, we, got, we have to understand, even though the enemy wants to convince you that God doesn't love you, I'm here to tell you that he loves you. I'm here to reaffirm that he died for your liberty and he died that you may have abundance. Yeah. Not just believing, but he died that you can be, have overcoming power. Tell somebody overcoming. Overcoming. Hallelujah. Amen. Israel out of Meribath. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Verse 2 says, so they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock to die of thirst? Here they were upset because they, was, they felt like, God didn't love them. He wasn't giving them what they need. How many of you got into a place and you felt like God wasn't giving you what you wanted? Before you grew a little bit. Come on, you ain't been here all the life. Before you grew, I know some of you sitting in here, my, my people looking like, okay. What? No, you wasn't here all, all the time. But the people were thirsty and they grumbled. But verse, verse 4 says, Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what, I'm to, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hands a staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock. And the water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Look what he says, verse 7. And he called the place Meshel and 
Meribeth because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord. Is the Lord among us or not? Often when confusion and conflict arises, especially in the church, the first thing people holler, I don't think God is here. And why do we feel like that? Do we feel that God will lead us somewhere to bring us somewhere just to walk away, to leave us? But why do we argue? Why do we complain? Why do we strike up complaints with one another? Why are we so dissatisfied? We question, we question whether God is truly with us. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. There have been some times in all of our lives that we have reached points where the people we serve did everything but act like God loved them. Said everything other than God is with us. Amen. Because we become, we come to a place where we become so uncontented. We start believing lies regarding God's love. We buy into this place we're in. Obviously, they felt God. Love was short. It was short-lived. It was insufficient because he was not meeting their needs as they expected him to. So they thought. When God does not move, when we want him to move, boy, we get all bent out of shape. I'm talking to the ones that say they have arrived. When God does not move because the Bible says, speak and things will happen. Well, you can speak it, but God may say, not right now. So even in that, you have to learn to praise him in that decision. You have to learn that, God, I'm going to trust you, but I believe and I know you're still able. God can say no when you say yes. So here they were, feeling some kind of way. He, they, well, he wasn't meeting their needs. They expected him to do this, and they questioned him. They, they questioned his ability to care. They questioned his ability to provide for them and their ability to sustain themselves in the wilderness. And you know what? They thought he was falling short on his promise of going to the promised land. When you believe a lie that the devil sends you, you begin to doubt. You even begin to doubt yourself. You begin to doubt your very call. You begin to doubt whether God is going to do what he said he was going to do. I'm reminded that before his word shall fail, that all heaven and earth shall pass away. I don't know about you, but if, if I look around every day, I'm still getting up and God's word is still reigning supreme. God's word is still standing. God, watch this. They were in slavery. They couldn't do what they were. They was at the hands of the Egyptians, and they prayed, and God delivered them. If God was able to deliver them out of that mess, he was certainly able to bring them into a promise. Amen. Look how they struggle. Believing, Mama Green, that, 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 that God had brought them down to, to the Red Sea because there weren't enough graves. Who told you that? Why would God bring you out just to kill you? God brought you out for a testimony. And with every testimony that comes a test, he is testing you. He wants to see where your faith is. The Bible says without faith, is, it is impossible to please him. So we don't come with rhetoric saying and repeating saying because there's nothing happen when we have rhetoric going on. We have to begin to understand God's word and understand what God's word says for our life and begin to believe the truth of his word. Dispel all the lies that we can have application. What's going to bring the joy in your life is the application of the word. I don't care how much you pray and hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But if there's no truth and no application, we're just repeating words. God wants you to live. How many of you really know how to talk to people? How many know how to get a complete thought over? I realize in the church, I'm just being honest, nothing against nobody. 
We can't get thoughts over without in, injecting words in that. Can you please complete a thought so somebody can get an understanding out of what you're saying? I just lost all of my followers. What about that lost person? Every five words, you, 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 you're interjecting something, but you, you're missing. There's no thought. When I look at Jesus and how Jesus spoke, when I look at Paul and how Paul spoke, when I look at the writers, they don't do oftentimes what we do. It doesn't make us any better because we start quoting words. Are we getting an understanding through? Are the people who are on the receiving end hearing a complete, tell somebody a complete thought, so they can begin to understand that God loves me. We have interjected so much of us in this thing that we're struggling. But I'm glad that the hope of God's word is really, tell somebody, restoring life. Restoring life. Amen? Amen? God was doing what he said he was do. Even Moses was scared. He was upset. Lord, these people are about to kill me. <laughs> now, you distrusting me too, Moses? Moses, get your staff that you, that you stroked and struck the Nile with. Take a couple of of the leaders, watch this, because everybody can't see the manifestation first. Take the leaders of Israel with you, and I want you to, there's a rock. And because I call you, the people need to understand that I have not lost any love in them. And you know what? When we feel like we have lost God's God don't, don't love us. We struggle with our faith. Watch this. I'm going to help somebody right where you are. When you are at that, that, that disappointment stage or that stage where you're moping and your emotional self and you feeling like nobody cares, you're actually saying, God don't care about me. When you find yourself, when the enemy gets you to a place where you can crawl into a space, shut the door, don't want to talk to nobody, you're simply saying, God don't love me. And you know why you're there? The enemy sold you that lie. When you, can't even find, when you cannot find encouragement in people, do like David said. David said, I learned to encourage Myself, how do you encourage yourself, Anthony? I simply remind myself that God loves me. When you find yourself in those challenging, challenging places, remind yourself, say it with me, God loves me. And say, God died for me. When you find yourself in those places, when you seem insignificant, remember that through Christ, I can do all things. I challenge you to find, find a, 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 some, some Bible verses that you can put on your dashboard when you drive, to put in your office cubicle, put on your wall, that whenever you feel some kind of way, when the enemy comes to you like he came to Eve, whispering in your ear that you ain't nothing and they, everything they said about you is right, don't believe the lie. Tell somebody to believe the hope in Jesus. Amen. Listen, let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. I told you we'll look at a couple of scenarios, different stories in the Bible. Amen. What are we ultimately saying about God and our relationship to him when we worry about our needs being met? Now, the Bible says he promised to supply not some of your needs. Tell us about all of our needs. Why do we worry about needs being met? I'm talking to you in this room. I'm talking to you who's watching on TV right now, live. When you find yourself worrying about your needs, you are simply saying that God really don't love me. When you do it consciously, subconsciously, whenever you do it, believing God has either forgotten about us or that he simply don't care. People that's down on their luck feel that God don't care. How many of you say, bad stuff always happened to me? Really, I wonder why. Because you stop trusting. 
You stop trusting in the very one who made you, who knows all about you, who has control of the cattle on a thousand hills, that controls all of the money. That was nothing made that was not made by him. When we start thinking like that, we tend to rob ourselves of what God can really do. I'm not important enough. How many of you ever said that you're not important enough? Amen. Since God won't do it, I got to take care of myself. You know what the problem is? We've been taking care of ourselves. And guess what we find out we, we've been doing? Messing it up. Can I just be honest with you? A lot of the havoc we have had in our life was we, we believed a lot and Satan didn't do nothing else. Oh, my. Listen, 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 listen. Listen, that's revelation. All Satan did was sold you a lie and you brought it. And he says, I want to do nothing else. Because now they're not going to trust God to help them even in this. When you understand who you are in Christ, and if you are in covenant relationship with him, he has to bless you. He has no other choice. He said in the word, if, 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 if evil people know how to give their, their kids good stuff, what makes you think that your heavenly father won't bless you? If those who are evil know how to bless their children, he simply says, I'm going to bless you. Why? It's because you're my child. It's a principle. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what ye will eat or drink, or what, or about your body, what ye will wear. Is not your life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor weep or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Now, those of you that are in the medical field understand when you worry, blood pressure go up. I, I wish I just had somebody would agree with me for a second. When you worry, headaches come on. When you worry, you can't sleep at night. You have sleepless nights. You toss and turn because you worry about things that's not going to add to your life, but only take away. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the leaders of the field? They grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, ye of little faith. Watch this, O ye of little faith. When we, when we distrust God is able to take care of us, then our faith suffers. We, we, we should begin to see something, a pattern. When we distrust the very fact that God will take care of us, then we struggle with our faith. Because we have to believe in him, right? That's faith. And to believe in him is to believe that he not only came that we may have life, but tell somebody to have life more abundantly. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that ye need them. Watch this. The pagans, the unsaved, watch this, runs after these things. 
what the Bible is saying. You don't have to run after them. He's saying, if you know me and you trust me, he says, I'm going to automatically provide. You don't have to run. He's saying the world runs after these things, but he's saying, if you serve me, if you trust me, you don't have to run. I'm going to automatically provide. He says, I will make a way even in the desert places. He's able to create water in the desert. Even though the children of Israel didn't have water, they was griping and complaining in the wilderness. God simply said, I will make a way even in the dry places. All you have to do is begin to trust me and stop distrusting God. There's somebody right now at a place where they are distrusting the fact that God is about to work in your favor. God is about to turn that messed up situation around. He's just saying, will you trust me? He says, don't believe the lie and go after what some bad advice somebody gave you. The problem is we get too much bad advice from folk that don't trust God that we get stopped trusting him and we get messed up. You listen to somebody that's chasing something they will never come to arrive at because they are doing it on their own. I would rather God do it for me and I take care of his business. He promised never to leave me. He promised never to forsake you. But the problem is when we don't know the word of God, we struggle. So that's why we're here. That's why we're watching. That's why we're embarking on this teaching to understand something that we have a spiritual identity in Christ. Tell somebody in Christ. Christ. Look what he says. And this is good. But seek, verse 33. First, tell me first. first. He says, instead of running after all of that stuff you say you need, he says, I want you to do one thing. He says, put me first. Are you with me in the word? Come on. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things that the pagans run after, all these things that the people of the world run after, he says, these things will be given to you as well. He says, They strive to get them. He says, but you strive to honor me. And because you strive to honor me, he says, you're going to get them without having to run after them. Somebody ought to shout glory. Glory. That would minister to somebody right now. There are so many people, even in ministry, are trying to do it the way the world has done it. When God says, honor me first. He says, they need it. You need it too. But he says, I'm, I'm getting you to understand now. Because I love you, you will get it automatically. Tell somebody automatically. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of his own. Seeking first the kingdom means to put the concerns of God ahead of your own. Uh Uh-oh. Watch this. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. Eve was concerned about herself. She wasn't concerned about what God wanted. You want to know why we face with what we are faced with? It's because Eve became concerned about herself. Eve stopped being concerned about God and what he spoke to her because he loved her. She became concerned about thinking God was holding something from her. And thrust all of us into a world full of sin. All because of one decision. The Bible said, well, the first Adam fell, the second Adam, somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. Well, the first Adam fell, the second Adam was going to make things right again. Well, the first Adam messed up the plan. God had a, I don't want to say a backup plan, but he had another plan. He had a plan that would bring salvation, that would bring the union of us back to God, where there was separation because of sin. Now the blood, the atonement of Christ. My God, somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we seek to meet our own needs first and then focus on God with leftover time. Mm. I don't want to deal with that because somebody's going to get offended. Some of you, Miss Bible studies, you miss church, not because you couldn't be here. It's because other things took precedence. Watch this. 
and you have choices. I'm just using as an example. I'm not saying be a, don't take that offense. I'm just using, trying to get you to understand something. But to put God's will ahead of what you want means that you trust God. Amen? Amen. We put ourselves before him. This approach to life is rooted in the fear that my needs might not be met. You know why we tend to shy away from God first? It's because we feel if we do this for the kingdom, I'm going to go like it. Now, I'm going to tell you, now, if you say you ain't never thought like that, you're telling a lie. If, I'm telling you, from the pull up into the back door, you felt that if you gave God was his, that your light bill was going to go lacking, you weren't going to have food in the house. See, watch it. I'm, I'm showing, uh, I'm talking to the church now. I'm talking to the church. I'm talking to the church. And then we always come up with this notion. The church is not doing anything for us. Amen. Maybe you might not be doing something for yourself. Oh. If you are the church, you are not doing something for yourself. The church today, we don't go to church anymore because the church today, they don't, they don't do right. They won't help me. But have you helped yourself? You put yourself before God. Now you're questioning God that he loves you. Yeah. Well, he still loves you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I thought you thought I won't go the other way. He never stopped loving you. There's nothing you can do so bad that he will stop loving you because he died for all your mishaps. He died for all your mess ups. He died for all your sins. Amen. Amen. So since he died, it doesn't make any difference. It's nothing you can do. I'm just spelling a lie that will stop God from loving you. Amen. Even when you're disobedient. That's why he died for you. That's why he came to love the world. Watch this. You, you never ask yourself why he died. He died for your hard headedness. He died for your rebellion. Yes. He died for your lies, your cheating, your talking and putting. He died for all of that stuff. He died for your uncommitment. When you don't be uncommitment, you, you're not hurting nobody because Jesus already died. He says, I still love you anyway. That's why I died at Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. So what's your quarrel now? Me. What's your gripe now? I need to understand that God loves me. Tell somebody he loves me. He loves me. The songwriter says, yes, Jesus loves me for the Bible tells me so. That's why we're studying it to understand. You should leave this teaching, I don't care if you're watching on TV, battling with the same issues, with the same lies the enemy has sold you because I come in the name of Jesus to put down any lie, to put down any deception, and if the devil, watch this, the devil often hits rise with people, the church, to put a bug in your ear. Them people don't really care about you. You see how they treated you? Okay, I thought you was a church. Why don't you display the love? Why don't you make what they think out of a lie? Come on, somebody. Yeah. Why don't you be the God that they can see that make the devil out of a liar? Tell somebody I come to make the devil out of a liar. Yeah. Instead of, oh, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace breakers. Yeah. The Bible talks about, wow, that's a whole nother lesson. Can I just move on? Can I move on? As we surrender our lives to him, to God and focus on serving him first, then he will meet our needs for us. He frees us to continue doing his kingdom work without being sidetracked. Oh my goodness, touch your neighbor and say, don't be sidetracked. Come on, come on, sidetrack. With pursuing the basic needs of life, we become so sidetracked trying to pursue things that God promised to provide. Mm. Yeah. Listen, listen, listen. We become so overwhelmed with trying to get riches when God told us he would give us an ability to serve him and he will urge us. I'm telling you, I'm dealing with some things for the kingdom, and it seems like it's taking all day. It's taking all year. It doesn't make any sense. But I found out today there's a bigger blessing. Oh, y'all ain't going to shout. That is a bigger blessing. God says, I've held up. Yeah, yeah. Watch this. 
Don't worry about tomorrow or next year. I found out today that God says, while you was worried about next year, a year and a half from now, God says, I'm going to work it out today. That's why he says, trust me. Tell somebody, trust me right now. There are some of you that's watching right now that need to trust God right now. Stop bickering like the Israelites were doing about the water. Stop, stop stirring up people in the church and start bringing people together. Now, I don't want you to miss the gathering downtown because I'm going to speak to your power that's in you. Y'all ain't going to get this. There's a something that's in you. You don't tell somebody you don't want to miss it. Because God help me, I'm going to teach that thing. Listen, listen. You've got to understand God has birthed something in you. Tell somebody that's power. Power to believe. That's power to trust. That I'm greater than what they said about me. Look at your communities. Communities are struggling because there's distrust. You know why they're shooting and killing? Because there's no trust anymore. Everybody's taking matters, watch this, in their own hands. That's why we have so much disasters. That's why we have so much hurt and pain. Because we ourselves, if we were honest, have taken matters. When God says they do you wrong, love them. Uh-uh, I'm going to deal with this myself. <laughs> see, see, we starting stuff now. See, you, you, you're about to start something that God, you didn't do it to God. Seek ye first righteousness. What is the righteous thing to do? Y'all, y'all, y'all I'm teaching y'all. What is the righteous thing to do? Anytime a situation arises, ask yourself. Not what would Jesus do, but what is the righteous thing to apply? We already know what he do because it said, but the question is, are you going to apply it? Yeah. Tell somebody application. application. We don't need to worry about anything. Non-Christians worry about these things. But not mature believers. When we are mature, listen, when we are mature, we don't worry no more. I understand some of you don't, can't attest to what I'm saying because you've grown a little mature. But look at 10 years ago where you were. Look where you were. 50, well, look where you were. 50, and you know what? We forget that we had to learn that God really loves us ourselves. Amen. So how are we going to get others to see that God loves them too? Are we willing to throw our arms around them? Because they're going to make mistakes. And guess what? We're going to still, I'm still going to make mistakes. But guess what? I know God loves me. He's not going to love me any less. So guess what? I pick myself up, dust myself off, keep going. Amen. You think I'm going to wallow because I made a mistake? And you go, ha, ha, ha. he made a mistake. Like, okay, no matter. God loves me still. Right. Come on, remind yourself that I may make mistakes. The Bible says, now unto him who is able to keep, the Bible says his love covers all my fault. Oh, my God. Listen, he says the love that he has for me, when I do mess up, when I make mistakes, I'm covered. Tell somebody I'm covered. I'm covered. Thank you, Jesus. Very quick, do I have time? Very quick. Let's look at the death of Lazarus. John chapter 11, verse 17 through 21. I got to hurry up. Listen, listen. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here. She said, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and she went to him. And Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house Comforting her, notice how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to moan there. Watch this. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Lord, if thou had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and he was troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked, come 
and see, Lord. They replied, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? Watch this. The Jews, those that were looking, see, why did he love him? He wept. He saw Mary and Martha going through. Do you not know God sees your struggles? Amen. Do you know, do you not know God sees your pain? Yes. Do you not understand when you feel like those moments when nobody else would not pick up the phone, stop by your house, even comfort you, to talk to you, God sees you and he knows. And the Bible said he was moved, he wept, but he said, show me. My God. They saw he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying, they were doubters. They questioned his ability. But one thing they failed to realize, that God had a love. He said, I, I, I don't no more call you stranger, I call you friend. And he says, he says, because I'm your friend, I reveal to you the things of my father. And what he wanted to know, he want, what he wanted to show them is that when God has a love for you, even when things seem bleak, I've been in that place in my life when I seemed like I had no help, but I had to quicken myself to be reminded that all my help Hallelujah. all my help, somebody shout all my help. Mary was hurt that Jesus did not come as soon as he heard that Lazarus was ill, he was truly he loved him. But because he didn't come, he died. Because he didn't show up when we wanted to. Things went south. She was grieving. She was confused. She was angry that God didn't care. But Jesus was short on action. Jesus did come and he wept over the loss that Mary and Martha was experiencing. But look what happened. Just because Jesus knows the outcome of our circumstances does not mean that he does not sympathize with us. Amen. Mm. Did not he sympathize in their sorrow? Yes, he, he saw them weeping and he wept. Yes. <laughs> That's how the Bible says that. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and he too grieved with them in their loss because he was a good friend. Yes. When you experience tragedy and the temptation to think that God did not intervene to stop it. Why didn't God stop this from happening? Why did God not stop this from happening in my community? Why did God still allow these things to happen? Why is God allowing suffering to take place? God joins us in our surfing and weeping along with us. He truly cares about what we're going through. We know the story. What happened? He, he, why did he raise Lazarus? <coughs> why did he raise Lazarus? Because he cared. Remember, there was grief. There was sorrow. But there was a great outcome. Because God loved. He arrives late. He already had heard. He, he empathized with them. He, he, he was saying, I, I, these are my friends. He, he sees you now. And he says, I, I just can't take it no more. I must align the elements. I must rally the angels. To move on your behalf. You've been boohooing your eyes out. Lord, you've forgotten about me. And Jesus said, I can't take it no more. The Bible says, when we don't know what to pray for, he's interceding on our behalf. Interceding what? Interceding what needs to happen for us to get the joy back. Interceding what we need to get the peace back. Most people, Mrs. Green, won't know it's because they won't spend time at the feet of Jesus. Knowing that even though I go through bad stuff, God still loves me. Can I show you something? And I, I got to go. 
if we're going to display the character of God's love, when people go through, you got to love them. When people are suffering, we have to love them. When people, I tell you, just having a bad time in life, we have to love them. Why? Because we become God's, part of God. His character is in our life. Amen? Amen. Listen, as you go through this next week, I post this on social media. We need to start to notice some different things about our emotion. Disbelieving God's love, we find ourselves in fear, anxiety, and fear. When we believe God's love, we find we have peace, contentment, and we have, say with me, joy. God will supply your safety. God will meet your needs. God will comfort you. God will sympathize with you in your trials. God loves you. And even when you fail, uh uh-oh, what time, how much time I got? Even when you fail, tell somebody he loves you. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5 and 6. Watch this. That's love. Watch this. What about that, that those, those individuals who are failing and not experiencing and they're just doing the wrong thing? Romans 5 and 6. You see at just at the right time when we were still powerless. How are we powerless when we don't have Christ in our lives? How are we powerless when we don't have the word in our lives? How are we powerless when we don't understand who we are and who we identify with? Christ died for the ungodly, for those who are without him. So guess what, church? We got a lot to learn. I'm talking to the saints that want to criticize, judge, and, 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 and tell folks, you got to love even when people don't get it. You got to be patient. You got to be long suffering. And if they don't do the right thing, love them like God love you. Don't talk them down. Pray for them. Tell them I'm going to learn to pray. Listen, listen, I want to pray for you right now. I don't have but long. Listen, I want to pray for you right where you are because God died for your freedom. And as we get ready almost to sign off, listen, I want to speak to you right where you are. I want you to understand that God died for your sins. I want you to right now just pray with you. Say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, allow me to see and to feel your love. Right now, I've learned that I can't believe the lie of the enemy. Even though I'm going through, it doesn't mean you don't care. It doesn't mean that you know how I feel. I'm learning to trust you. I've struggled with this trust in the past. And I repent right now. And I want you to know, Lord, I'm going to turn away from that mindset. And I'm going to start casting my hope on you. I'm going to chase after you, Lord. Putting you first in everything. Honoring you with everything I do. Because I know you're about to provide all my needs. Thank you now in the name of Jesus. Save, heal, set free, deliver, God. Release your anointing on my life. Touch right now in a mighty way. Give me peace. Give me power that I may live and I may declare the glory among all the nations in Jesus name listen God loves you listen I hope this teaching has blessed you like it has blessed me we all have struggled because we were in the place of then no we didn't know that God oftentimes will allow us to go through some things but it doesn't mean he doesn't care It doesn't mean that he has forgotten about us. But listen, I've enjoyed myself. I've enjoyed myself for this time. Remember, I'm Anthony Claw. You can uh, call us for prayer. We're here to pray for you. You can contact us on our website through social media. We're here for you. Listen, I love you and I thank God for you. Keep trusting God. Remember that we need to believe in his love and he will prove that he loves us. Have a wonderful day, morning, evening, night. Have a blessed day. God bless you. Come on, say goodbye. Clap your hands.